Welcome back to Progressive Talk. This is episode five with Dave and Josh. We're going to be covering Mike Gravel, Andrew Yang, Tulsi Gabbard, uh, some of the polls. So stick around. So Bernie and AOC got together and they, they talked about uh, lowering interest rates and they talked about a fixed interest rate at 15 percent. Uh, what's your thought about that, Josh? They're saying the cap would be at 15 percent. That's the maximum credit cards could charge you. Uh, on interest rate argument against the cap credit card companies would be less likely to or more apprehensive to give just 15 percent i think it's a shallow argument really because the average rate at this time is 17 percent so moving from 17 15 is not that you know great and i think the idea is that we're wanting to get people off of credit cards altogether you know off of having to be in debt and horrible rates I think it's a good policy. Okay. I think most Americans can agree with that. I mean, have you ever owned a credit card, Dave? I've never owned a credit card. I can actually say that. Wow, look at you. The smart of you, maybe. Good, <laughs> yeah, good yeah. I just, never wanted, I just never wanted that that burden. I just went without it. If I didn't have it, I went without it. That's what I did. Ideal way to go, absolutely. But if you've ever owned a credit card, a lot of the credit cards, they throw interest on top of your principal. Uh, and sometimes it can change overnight and you have nothing you can do about it. You know, you have to read the fine print. Uh, even the fine print can change based upon what the regulations are, what credit cards can and can't do. So it's a big mess. It's chaos. Yeah, yeah. Uh, some of you may know, Marianne Williamson did qualify for the debates, so she is in. Awesome. Yeah. And Mike Gavell is still lacking quite a bit. Uh, we got, what, three days left? Yeah, I don't think he's going to make it, Josh. Yeah, it's unfortunate because he's got a lot of great ideas. Have you heard of the one where he wants to change the Constitution, where Americans would be able to vote on legislation? Ooh, I like the sound of that. Yeah, um, that's one of the big ones that he's, that's his really his, what he calls his flagship program. So that's an excellent one. So anybody listening, if you haven't donated already, I, I highly recommend that, that you do that. I remember uh, Kyle Kalinske was talking about, uh, I don't know if he was talking about Mike Ravel at the time, but he was talking about how we should get to the point where we're voting on policy with our with our phones. Uh, I don't know. It just it sounds kind of futurist, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we're, 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 we're actually participating directly in with democracy with our smartphones, um, voting on legislations. I don't know. Like, it just, I'd yeah. like to see us move direction to, to be you know we're so connected we can do that now we we can try that i think that's an awesome idea the question i have is is it going to require a change to the constitution and can you achieve something like that with the current uh makeup that we have in congress and the senate yeah. <laughs> you know republicans right. they they are hardline uh strict constructionist you know the constitution is holy bible you know you don't mess with it uh so but yeah i, I totally would i think that would be a, a totally benefit to the american people and that's true democracy in my in my mind yeah that would yeah that, i think it would benefit us but just to give you some ideas of some of the things he's sponsoring abolishing the electoral college uh, national rank choice voting 12-year terms for all federal judges Puerto Rico being a state. Also, he has a form of UBI, by the way. I don't know if you know that. He calls it the national dividend. It's taken out of the American National Fund. So it's set up in the same way that Alaska sets up their dividend okay. based upon uh, national resources. So 5% of the fund would be used toward a universal dividend for all Americans 18 and older. So you don't have to opt in. You don't have to get out of your programs. If you're 65 and older, you don't have to choose between your Social Security and the dividend. So, oh, wow. Yeah. And he's for reparations uh, as well. Green New Deal, automatic tax filing, public banking, progressive tax reform, housing as a human right, health as a human right, Internet as access as a human right, banning all nuclear weapons worldwide, globally pulling out of all wars and uh, bringing every troop home. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. He's, he's pretty wow. phenomenal. Yeah. 
why is this guy having trouble getting on the Democratic debate stage? Mm-hmm. Or any mm-hmm. debate stage, for that matter. Just anywhere. This guy should be front and center in, in the Democratic Party. Uh, it, it's just like, wow, everything you reeled off there, I just couldn't agree more with. Totally mind-boggling. He's he's a superhero. Know, right? uh, <laughs> any other news? Let's see. Uh, before we go on to other topics, again, just make sure that you do donate to his campaign. Just All you need to do is donate $1. We'll leave the link below. You know, you never know. He definitely will be a plus. Ever hear anything more about the potential 65K moving to 100K donations for the DNC uh, debate stage? No, I haven't. Who else has? You know. Right, absolutely. Let us know if you, you have something official on that. It looks like the city of Denver uh, decriminalized magic mushrooms. What are your thoughts about decriminalizing mm-hmm. drugs or legalizing drugs? Where do you stand on that? Oh, I'm pure. I would say my purest libertarian strands are right there. Okay. Uh, like I legalize like most, if not all drugs. Uh, I take the position that, you know, what adults do with other adults behind closed doors is up to them uh, and themselves and the government should stay out of it. Uh, unless it's like recovery or like, uh, you know, treatment, we need to set up you know, treatment centers and stuff like that, but it just needs, we need to decriminalize most, uh, if not all drugs. And magic mushrooms, that's great. Like there, there is a super low overdose rate, kind of like marijuana, where it's just like, yeah, there can be psychosis, but it's just a great move. Are you for decriminalizing? Yeah, uh, I'm for decriminalizing, absolutely. Uh, I'm for decriminalizing all drugs, honestly. Uh, legalizing, however, I do have my limits on that. Yeah, like you, I think it it really is about not attaching a stigma to it so that if people get addicted, they have a way to go to mental health without feeling, you know, they're going to get in trouble with the law. And that can't be had if you're going to, you know. And I also think of it the same way I think of a bottle of Clorox under the sink. I mean, if you take a bottle of Clorox, it's perfectly legal to purchase Clorox. Um there are other ways to get high, you know, uh, we can get high off of um, eating a huge bucket of ice cream. <laughs> may not <laughs> right, kill right. you initially, may not kill you initially, it might in the long term, but that's not right. illegal. So I think it really, we all have to encourage each other to take, to take response, self-responsibility, you know, as, Absolutely. as as adults, of course, 18 and older, of course. Definitely. And then uh, other news, uh, what did you think about Trump's pitch? I didn't see the actual speech, but I do know he's pitching that we go back to the moon by 2024. And I think this is one of his um, sort of uh, campaign enticements, if you will. And I think it'll actually be uh, a positive because no matter who who's in there going back to the moon or just going to the moon, whatever, uh, most people are for advancements like that, and I see that as a positive for Trump or any president uh, who mm-hmm. uh, goes that route. Did you, by chance, catch the Tulsi Gabbard interview with The Intercept? Oh, yeah, yeah, that was really good. Glenn Greenwald did a really good job of summarizing everything right up front, all of her political stands. You know, I think that was a really nice segment there that she was able to at least get that highlighted because everybody always knows her as the anti-regime change candidate, you know, and while that's good, kind of makes her seem like she's a one-trick pony. Yeah, she's not. (laughs) And Tulsi is not a one-trick pony. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, she has. So she was basically saying how she wants, uh, you know, she is the regime change war candidate or anti-regime change war candidate and how she talked about no one was, not enough people are doing that. They're not coming out being anti-war. They're not making it a part of their their campaigns. And she mentioned how she wants that to lead her campaign. The question was, given that you supported Bernie back in 2016, why not support him? Right, right, right. And don't run. Basically, like, why are you running when you can just support Bernie this time? So that's when she talked about being the anti-regime change war candidate. Uh, and And we know Bernie is too, to a degree, right? I mean. Oh, yeah. I do think that when Bernie Sanders initially came out, he was a lot more vocal. 
about being uh, against interventionist war and even went around touting how he voted against Iraq and uh, that that's really the stand we should be taking. But I think what people have to appreciate, in my opinion, is that when you start getting up being you know number one or number two, you have to keep in mind that corporate media is going to completely shut you out if you're running around talking about you know being against corporate wars. I think Tulsi Gabbard stands to gain from that, you know, is what I'm saying. Kind of a groundswell she can build from that. More difficult for corporate media to ignore her. Whereas for Sanders, they already know he's got his following. And so for him to come out and talk openly about that, I think they would completely try to shut him out altogether. That's kind of, I think he's taking a calculated approach to that. But if you look at his record, there's no there is no doubt about it. You know, he's got the track record, you know, uh, getting us out of Yemen, voting against Iraq. You know, I'm not saying he's 100 percent. Don't get me wrong. You know, uh, he's probably around 80 percent. But if you want to think about all the candidates out there, he's in the top three uh, in regards to being anti-war. What are your easily. thoughts? Yeah, easily. I, I, he's still as much crap as people give Bernie for being uh quote unquote weak on foreign policy, he's still there on, on so many issues that you just mentioned. Uh, and, you know, I, I, people, I think people are forgetting that, uh, that he voted against the, the Iraq war, that, you know, he just passed the War Powers Act f- for Yemen. And like, there's so many good things he's doing and that he's done. It seems like they do get swept aside by a few things that may be suspicious. Like, uh, well, I forget, back in the 90s, didn't he vote for... Uh, the Czech war that was going on, the Czechoslovakia. Uh, yeah, Bosnia. something about that. I hear that one a lot. Bosnia, there we go. But, you know, if we're wanting to be 100% fair here, then we would look at the fact that Tulsi Gabbard voted for increasing the defense budget in 2018. Right. Uh, Sanders never has. Every time it comes around, he votes against it. Tulsi Gabbard is for drone strikes. And so is Bernie. But if we're really wanting to be fair here, you know, and it's not trying to compare Tulsi to Bernie, but again, just bringing forth that maybe Bernie's being treated unfairly here, you know, in regards to how he's being framed. Um, if we really want to look at him, he's pretty darn close to Tulsi. Um, I would only say Tulsi is a lot more vocal. Again, I think it's political calculation. I think it's wiser Bernie to be calculative in this instance. I think it serves him. Anything about more of that of that Glenn Greenwald interview? Um, anything that leaps oh. out at you? Mm-hmm. No, um, everything else was pretty standard, you know, about her stands. Uh, was by the Telsey Gabbard book, you know. Um, okay, so that's one really good moment that she highlighted, and and this is just reiterating what she's been doing over the course of the past many years when she goes on to different uh, media. I think it was him who asked. Why are we seeing the rise of autocracy throughout the world, you know, authoritarianism? And she said it's because corporate America, uh, not just corporate, but, corp- uh, you know, billionaires, uh, oligarchy has taken over the world. Corporations have taken over the world and it's not tuning into the needs of the people. And that is causing a lot of instability for people. And they're looking for something, you know, that they can put their belief in, you know. So she didn't say those exact words, but I thought that was a really good moment in the interview. Yeah, no, that's definitely like TPP and NAFTA and all these other global uh, trade agreements have destabilized, uh, you know, uh, economies. And it's a backlash. What she was describing was that there's a backlash uh, against these globalist entities. And it's in America, it's in Brazil, it's in France, it's all across the world. And these people start looking towards quote unquote, strong men, okay, who just show a lot of toughness and have a populist appeal. Uh, A lot of them are charlatans, unfortunately, like Bolsonaro or or Donald Trump or, you know, but people are so Mm desperate, right, they're just so desperate that it's like, okay, I got to have faith in somebody. And that's pretty much just just what she was trying to convey. And they tend to uh, find a scapegoat, uh, of course. That's, you know, Mm -hmm. unfortunately... They bring out the um, the seedy parts of any nation because it, it builds up their base, and that's how they get elected. So, yeah. yep, scapegoats. Everything I I recall, the better parts of the intercept interview. Okay, yeah, 
So uh, apparently a couple of new polls came out recently, Dave, um, showing yeah. what, what, did, what did it indicate? Okay, so the latest uh, Monmouth poll uh, came oh. out May 9th, and it had Biden in the lead, 36 points, Sanders at second place, 18 points, Buttigieg, 9 points, Warren, 8 points, and Harris, 6 points. Mm. And then uh, the morning consult poll had... Uh, morning consult May 7th had Biden 40 points, Sanders 19, Warren 8, Buttigieg 6, O'Rourke 6. So topping the polls, Biden, like we said, he was going to get a bump, right? He's going to get a bump. Uh, and the, okay, so Monmouth poll 36, uh, morning consult poll 40. Okay. Sanders 18, Monmouth and Sanders 19 morning consult. So very, they're, they're a couple points, you know, or a point apart. Okay. Wow. Um, do you feel the polls are really reflecting where people are right now with the election? Mm -hmm. I, I don't think so. Um, like these polls, I'm more inclined to look at and believe. Uh, they're a little bit more credible, but there's been so many skewed polls for Joe Biden uh, where, where they're polling one to 200 people on landlines uh, over the age of 50 uh, and really just just abnormal uh, <laughs> polling uh, conditions. And, and, they're, and they're just showing, you know, Biden, you know, 32 points ahead, 40 points, ahead, just ridiculous margins that you just know it's skewed. But. Here's the thing. Biden is the front runner, even without them skewing the polls. Biden is the front runner right now. He was supposed to get a bump. He got a bump. And I like I even have to come to grips with that because I think a lot of progressives are just like, oh, it's all fake. It's all. No, I think Biden has a legit margin right now because of name recognition, the Obama years and whatnot. And we need to come to terms with that and deal with that. And we will. Um, but there's just been so many polls that are skewed ridiculously. Uh, the Hill runs them, CNN runs them, MSNBC runs them. They get a lot of legs in, 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 in MSM. So we have to be concerned that that's going on. But bottom line here for me is Biden is the front runner and we need to deal with it. So what did you think about uh, David Pakman releasing a video about four days ago stating or his title was video was people are lying about democratic 2020 polls essentially saying that oh, you know progressives on the left they they can't deal with that biden's ahead and they're, they're twisting in all kinds of directions to make it you know to um deny the fact that the polls are in fact accurate that they they did proper sampling proper methodology that he is that far ahead but we're just in denial. And that he labeled anyone that is saying otherwise is is essentially just lying to themselves. OK, I, I, I'm I'm kind of running that trajectory um, where it's like I, I can recognize there are polls that are skewed. OK, just by looking at who they polled, like one to two hundred people over the age of 50, you know, all these weird stats. Are just like, OK, that's not an honest poll. I can see that. But there are some more honest polls out there that do show Biden in the lead. He's in yeah. the lead for and it's in. Like I said, it's for now. Like it's just the momentary bump as soon as he gets to the debate stage and he's going to get outflanked. He's going to get outflanked from the left, from Bernie Sanders, from Tulsi Gabbard, uh, from Andrew Yang. And he's just going to be exposed for the conservative Democrat that Biden is. And he's going to take a dip in the polls. That's just my prediction. But. I think Pacman was saying that there are some kind of like what I'm saying here now. There are some legit polls and there are some other polls that are skewed uh, and we need to look at them a little bit closer. OK. Yeah, I thought I felt like he's being a little unfair, but I, I do agree with you. You know, he did try to balance it by presenting one that he he felt was opaque and, you know, um, but otherwise, yeah, that I felt a little bit harsh. Oh, pac Pacman's been getting a lot of crap lately um, for uh, coming off as a centrist. I, I just noticed a lot of people are attacking Pacman lately, um, mm -hmm. and he's been one of my favorites for the longest time. But I, I got I'm, I'm hearing so many poor things about him. Maybe I should take a look at David Pacman in a new light because I'm just hearing from all sides 
uh, about and Jank Uger, to be honest, Jank Uger and David Pakman, how they've become more centrist. Um, uh, M- MSNBC light. I keep hearing these words, and it's like, okay, do I have to rethink David Pakman here, or what, what do you think about David Pakman in general? Obviously, mm-hmm. no, I, I think in general he is a capitalist. You know, it's his channel, uh, his subscribers. Uh, I'm not going to unsubscribe to him. I think he puts on a really, really good show. He has moments that he's brilliant and he really shines, you know, as a, as a progressive. You know, the progressivism shines through. But I do think there are times that there are moments, you know, that, yeah, do look a little centrist. But again, I, I do want to shy away from the understanding that progressivism doesn't include centrists. You know, if he starts going uh, to the place where he is dismantling the big ones, you know, coming out against Medicare for all and $15 minimum wage. Yeah. Okay. Then I have, I'd be some, I'd be really concerned, but I think it is important, uh, you know, to challenge, uh, a narrative, you know, calling people who question pose as liars. That's more, you know, the tone that he's putting out that I'm questioning. I'm not really questioning, you know, is he a centrist? I do think he has a little of a set of narrower understanding of progressivism that maybe I do or you do. My biggest criticism was he was calling us liars, which I didn't appreciate that. He, he could have titled that differently. He could have said that differently. I thought it was uh, it was not good. It was insensitive. I agree. That's a little harsh. And, 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 and divisive. But I like him, and I think he's good. Something you said earlier came to mind as you were speaking about the pose, and you were saying that when we get to the debate stage, and I hear this a lot from a lot of people, and even I've said this, they intuitively feel based on Biden's history, you know, he's the gaff king, that he's going to start speaking, he's going to come across as a centrist, his numbers are going to go down. And while I want to believe that, I think there's more to it than just Biden. I think you have to contextualize this. And the context here right now is anyone that is a progressive, and progressives are not socialists, but anyone that's progressive as socialist. And I think mm-hmm. that the election is going to really come down to that. And I know we want to try to avoid that, but I do think Fox News is going to try to set up the context uh, of the general election. And that's going to, of course, affect the primaries as well. So they're going to try to weaponize uh, a stigmatized word, uh, the word socialist. And you're thinking that's going to push people towards the center, towards someone like Biden, if they if they re-stigmatize the word socialist socialism uh enough it'll get the people in the middle to move more towards someone like biden is that basically what you're saying right now i'm not saying absolutely but i do think that there this is the framing that is being set up and i I think it has a high chance of yeah pushing people toward biden that's an interesting view because they've been doing a lot of framing that kind of narrative over the past year, you know, you're a socialist if you're for Medicare for all. You're a socialist for this, socialist for that. And they've and, done that for years. Okay, yeah. When when Johnson came out uh, with Medicare, like that was seen as a socialist takeover. You know, Red Scare. Uh, and like any time you look back in American history, where where we we came up with Social Security uh, or Medicare or Medicaid, there was an attack from the far right that you know used red scare uh mentality in terms and they're going well, to do it again with with when in his policies well let me tell you why i think it's a little bit different this time around a uh, window over to that direction and frame it in that way uh, to their uh, benefit the first is we have the most progressive agenda that we have probably ever had historically you know things that easily could be labeled as socialist ubi medicare for all 15 dollars minimum wage you name it across the gamut there's a variety of policies that clearly could be labeled socialist even though they may not be that's the first one the second one that could provide them success to that end is the russia gate investigation trump came out innocent uh, in the end, and they will look at that as a collective body that went after Trump. And th- you don't want that. That's what socialism leads to. And now Venezuela is also very front and center. And they'll crop that up again. <laughs> you know. And the economy right now is good, uh, which serves their capitalist agenda. So you've got four, at least four, major 
that they can use to good effect. Yeah, that, points of attack, let's say. Points of attack, right, there you go. I'm not trying to put everybody yeah. into dark Absolutely. place and you know pessimistic or anything, but I think it's good to be aware. Expected. I think things you just got to expect though from from the far right and, and media at large uh mm-hmm. is is framing their attacks uh with skewed framing and in a lot of time a lot of people miss skewed framing they accept skewed framing as fact and they and they try to skew it ever so slightly and you, know, you gotta watch out for it you don't have to be paranoid uh but you just gotta watch out for it if it doesn't sound honest you know investigate it did you see the new hampshire public radio and yang interview Yes, I even did a video on it on my channel. Okay. Good interview, solid interview. What was the main takeaway yep. from that interview for you? A bunch of things stuck out. Uh, one was they were talking about the Freedom Dividend, and, mm-hmm. and Milton Friedman came up, as he usually does. Um, and one key distinction from Andrew's version of, of Dividend mm-hmm. uh, was that Andrew's is free and clear. And has no oversight attached, where I guess Friedman's did. Um, so I thought that was an interesting point of distinction between those two, because they get compared a lot. Right. I think that uh, Milton's is need-based, you know, below a certain income, then you get a kind of UBI, negative income tax or okay. something like that, based. Whereas, you know, as you said, Andrew Yang's is across the board, except for the opt-ins. Right, right, right. Yeah, so that was that was an interesting point. Um, he talked about financial literacy. Uh, Andrew said uh, he supports financial literacy programs uh, that are federally funded, and it would help people uh, spend their UBI more wisely. Mm-hmm. So I think that's 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 a great thing to have federal programs that help people uh, with money. That's one thing. I when I when I was working as a CPS in social work, uh, one of the things I would do is I would budget with people uh, who have mental health problems, physical health problems, just poor people who need to learn how to budget. And I just think it's a great idea uh, for people to learn how to spend money wisely. Absolutely. What were your thoughts about uh, his answer to Medicare for all? What did, was that convincing for you? Um, well, he's still for the, 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 yeah, he's still for the public option, right? Okay. He's, I think uh, people have some confusion of understanding Medicare for all as a public option. They don't necessarily have to be two different things. What is your thought on that? At this point, I'm fully convinced he wants the the Medicare for all public option. He even said he wants people. He said it'll go away. Like he said, the private insurance companies are will basically go away on it on their own when people realize that there's a cheaper uh, and and better coverage option on the market like Medicare for all. Okay. Are you doubting him? It sounds like you might be doubting him. I mean, I I mainly just for for anyone coming new into the political arena, uh, I think it's good to always hold some dose of healthy, uh, you know, reservations. You know, uh, we don't know him. Uh, He can make all kinds of promises. He's never been in politics. Maybe he doesn't know how it works on the inside. And this is not to compare him to Sanders. But with Sanders, you know that he has been fighting for this most of his all of his political career so you know he is for that he's the one that brought it to the public's attention we don't get that you know we don't get that uh history so yeah that's that's all that's pretty much all the other the other part of it too is you know as i said he seems to have gotten a little more uh clear about how we get there now he's pointing out the five to ten years maybe he's sort of filling it through as well i don't know you know like i said he's never been in politics uh, can you explain to listeners, is Medicare for all and public option, do they need to be diametrically opposed to one another? Can you embed it as a public option? I think it won't be like the Sanders gold standard Medicare for all. It, mm-hmm. It'll definitely, I, I would assume it will, it'll take some hits, especially when you're dealing with the Republicans who are probably going to mutilate it to death in some mm-hmm. fashion. So I would expect a Medicare for all public option to look very different from Sanders's uh, proposal, which which I said is the gold standard. Uh, but yeah, I'm sure you can have a form of Medicare for all. You just won't get the best Medicare for all that there is. Okay. Interpreting what you're saying is because it's not airtight. 
Uh, Sanders is, it's done, uh, it's airtight, you can't get in, it's hermetically sealed. It'd be much, much more difficult for Republicans to try to dismantle that, much similar to Social Security, uh, because it's airtight. It's for everyone's over 65, it's universal. It's going to be very difficult for people to dismantle, you know, Republicans come in and dismantle that. Whereas Yang's public option Medicare for all, you're allowing a lot more open windows and doors for them to break in, you know, and undermine it. That your argument? Yeah, basically so. There's going to be vulnerabilities and there's going to be, uh, you know, just a mutilated version of Sanders bill, uh, which is, you know, the gold, gold standard in Medicare for all. It, it'll just be you know, put through the ringer and the Republicans will get a hold of it. They'll chop it up and, you know, there'll okay. be a huge compromise. So it'll be, a, it'll be like, it'll be a hollow, more hollowed out Medicare for all, but it will be the most affordable, likely option on the market. So. Okay. Would that dissuade you from supporting him? Uh, Bernie or Andrew Yang? Andrew Yang. Yes, it's actually affected my support for him. But yeah, I just disagree with the public option. I believe that we are in it is time to pass Medicare for all, uh, the one that goes the furthest, the one that protects uh, everybody and mm -hmm. is not an option. It's just implemented fully. Some might argue, since you're receiving UBI, you might be able to afford premiums for a while. While it takes time for Medicare for all to fully cover everyone, you know, five, 10 years, as Andrew Yang is optimistically pointed out during his interview with NHPR. What are your thoughts on that? Hmm. Yeah, I'm sure that's possible. I'm sure that can happen. What, what's the rollout again? What, what is Yang's rollout? Because Bernie's rollout is four years. What is Yang's okay. rollout? Well, he doesn't have an official rollout, but he did say uh, during the New Hampshire public radio interview that he optimistically uh, believes it could happen within five to ten years. Five to ten. Yeah, that's. I don't like those numbers. <laughs> I like the four years. Everybody covered four years, and once again, like you cannot beat Bernie's yeah. uh, Medicare for all, no matter who you are. It just doesn't matter if it's Andrew Yang or. Uh, Pete Buttigieg or anybody who supports the public option. Um, yeah, Sanders is, uh, you know, covers everybody. He goes the furthest uh, with dental, with vision. Uh, you know, it just, it goes the furthest. It's where we need to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I read somewhere the average medical cost was about, 450 for a single person in 2018 and about $1,200 for a family of four. Oh. So with the UBI, you're looking at $1,000 a month. That's just presuming you get basic coverage and you don't even see the doctor. You know, you don't go out and you don't, you don't have to pick up medications. You didn't break a leg. You know, you don't have to get scanned on, see the doctor. So uh, I don't know how much of that UBI would actually cover the medical cost. Probably just depends on the person. Yeah, definitely. It's just so much easier to cover everybody and work from there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, raise taxes, what, 3%, 4% or something like that? Yep, 4% income tax. How realistic do you think Bernie Sanders' four-year plan is, considering that most likely stay Republican in 2020? Yeah, I, I still, I think four years is reasonable. Uh, I, I, I honestly don't know what is great or what isn't here as far as a rollout. Five to ten years, I mean, that obviously sounds too long. Anything over five years sounds too long. Um, so four years sounds about right. Yeah, and I, I just, I'll always go for the Bernie Medicare for all over the public option in every, up against anybody, whether it's Yang, whether it's Buttigieg, whether it's, I was going to say Biden, but I don't even think he's at Medicare for for all is he uh no he's not but with the filibuster you have to get a 60 vote threshold to move a final vote to all legislation <laughs> what do you think yeah, do you but, think bernie can pull it off he's not even going to be in the senate if he gets elected some i don't know who would replace him yeah true i mean uh i mean listen right now i mean the last poll i saw had republicans supporting medicare for all at 52 percent yeah, I, it's so, no question the, the vast majority of Americans support Medi Medicare for all. But if you go down the line in the Senate, realistically speaking, 
the Republicans, I would say you'd be lucky to find one or two. Okay, yeah. Yeah, you got to get 10 to, to, to get a bill passed. You're going to have to get 10 uh, Republican senators on You'll have to get more than 10 because there's only 46 yeah. Democrats and not all the Democrats even support Medicare for all. Yeah, I mean, yeah, 2020, There, I mean, we could get a couple seats in the Senate. We could at least get 50, 51, I think. Mm, uh, yeah, maybe, but I think we're really looking through <laughs> happy eyeglasses here. I think realistically we might pick up one or two if we're fortunate. Because most all of the competitions are in red states. Well, it comes down to the people. I mean, if 52% of Republicans want it now, uh, you know, maybe it'll be 60 and 70%. Maybe that because it's really about us and what we want. And if we push them enough, you know, if Republicans really want it, they'll take it to the representatives and, you know, if push the nation, them hard on. If the nation weren't so split, Dave, I'd agree with you. But, you know, the red states are pretty hard line red. Uh, blue states, I, pretty blue. And, you know, Alabama's very unlikely to vote for a Democrat. Um, South Carolina, very unlikely to replace Lindsey Graham. You know, yeah, I wish it were more representative across the board you know the demographics were more spread out and even but it's not We've got a very divided nation still yeah unfortunately you know. it's this one i can no absolutely i get you but i i'm just thinking i'm trying to be as thoughtful as i can about what's in what's what is within the realms realm of realism here That's i think good. it's one thing to be optimist optimistic another thing to be an idealist you know sure. um so, I, yeah, I still got to do some mulling over this, thinking over this um, consideration, because even if Sanders won a Medicare for all, you know, unless he did an executive order, which I'm not even sure he could do that. I'd have to, hmm. Do you know if that's possible? Well, I don't know. I didn't think uh, Trump uh, was able to declare uh, an emergency for his wall, but he did that. Uh, you know, and I've always heard like since that sets a president. Uh, you know, for the, exec the executive branch to do something drastic, why not make climate change or Medicare for all uh, an emergency, uh, declare them emergencies, and then work on them that way if you can get cooperation in the Senate? Uh, you know, Trump, Trump, Trump just set the precedent, so why not? <laughs> Yeah, but do we want that? I mean, do, do well, we want to do it just because we maybe because Trump did it and tit for tat? And is that constitu Is that really constitutional? Is that the, is that the presidents we want to continue to Trump's presidents? Do we want to follow like, that? Yeah. No, likely not. And 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 to be honest, like I I I think executive powers uh, are too strong and they should be receded uh, back into Congress. Uh, so, you know, it, even though he is doing it and it sounds good that, oh, well, he's doing it. Well, maybe we should, too. It's something we want. It is bad to go forward with it because then it keeps going higher and higher and further and further outside the realm of uh, our structures. The unfortunate thing here is we really, truly do not have a representative Congress. Um, OK. Big money interest has spoiled that for us. Yes. Knowing that, I have to tell you, I really think that Andrew Yang's projection on this is more realistic. Now, in a principled way, uh, Bernie Sanders, you know, hands down. I mean, I, I want that now, like him. He's been working at it. We've been working at it for years. I get it. I get it. I totally get it. I just don't know what's practical. Yeah, well, if it's practical, absolutely. Yeah, and you have a good argument there that that the public option, uh, which is more robustly, uh, more candidates have gone to bat for that than the Sanders bill, to my knowledge. I mean, I know there's a Medicare for all caucus that has, uh, what, 70 members or something like they're building a huge caucus in Congress in the uh, House, mm -hmm. in the House. Uh, but it seems it does seem like more people are for the uh, med at least the Democratic primary candidates are for mm -hmm. the public option. It yeah, seems like I, I think that you would get you would get almost every single senator behind a public option for Medicare for all or at least lowering it to 55. Um, yeah. And you might even pick up a, a few 
handful of Republicans. Yeah. I'm not Definitely. as confident when it comes to Medicare for all. I'm not even confident we can get the numbers on the Democratic side. You might be might be split. True. So the only way that would happen I, in my mind would be if 2022 came along and Democratic seats were definitely up and Bernie Sanders was able to set the progressive movement on fire and get them out in droves and they were threatened with their seats and we timed it right to get the bill in and maybe then. Maybe then, you know. Any other topics you on hand, Dave? I think we covered no, pretty much. about it. I guess that's about yeah. it. We covered a lot. Okay. All right. That's uh, episode five, Progressive Talk. But before we go, make sure you go over to Dave's channel. I'll provide the link below and help him grow his channel to meet, where are you now, about 830 maybe? Yeah, somewhere eight, eight and some change. Uh, okay. We want to get his voice out there so we can continue to promote the Progressive Candidates. So please go support him, subscribe to his channel, get him up over the threshold to get him monetized. I think that, what is it, 1,200 or something like that? Um, take the time to view his videos. A thousand. A thousand. Yeah, the, YouTube, the, the new YouTube requirements for 2019 are 1,000 subscribers and 240,000 uh, watch time minutes. Okay. And that will help Dave out, too. Then he can... You know, use that money to toward the channel and uh, have more time to focus on different things. Uh, and it also will help the progressive community because there's one more voice out there that is much more visible. So definitely support his channel. All right, Dave, thanks for coming on again. Um, enjoyed this and uh, see you next week. All right. See you next week for episode six. Absolutely. Take care. Uh, take care, man.